Hey there, welcome. Seth <laughs> 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 Rogen, writer, producer, and actor you know from Pineapple Express, knocked up, and super bad. They love the hit. <laughs> Hollywood, it's not a fair industry. It is not fair who makes it. Any given phone call is one that is like making your life or one that is yet another door slamming in your face. We had finished super bad and then we wrote Pineapple Express. No one wanted to make it. <laughs> but if you don't quit, you might make it. People would obviously look at you and assume that you have zero self-doubt because you've been so successful in what you've done. But what's your journey been with self-doubt? I'm at the point, it's funny in my career, where like not a lot of people are in a position to like yell at me. But I will have a cultural institution tell everyone that I suck. That will add self-doubt. Green Hornet, you received critical reviews for that. Like, what's that phase like? Any opening weekend, honestly, and any time I have a thing coming out, it sucks. I think if most critics knew how much it hurt the people that they are writing about, they would second guess the way they write these things. <laughs> like, it's devastating and something that people carry with them literally their entire lives. Before we get into this episode, just wanted to say thank you, first and foremost, for being part of this community. Um, the team here at The Diver CEO is now almost 30 people, and that's literally because you watch and you subscribe and you um, leave comments and you like the videos that this show has been able to grow. And it's the greatest honor of my life to sit here with these incredible people and just selfishly ask them questions that I'm pondering over or worrying about in my life. But this is just the beginning for the Diary of a CEO. We've got big, big plans to scale this show um, to every corner of the world and to, to, to diversify our guest selection. And that's enabled by you, by a simple thing that you guys do, which is to watch. So if there's one thing you could do to help this show and to help us continue to do what we do, it's just to hit the subscribe button. If you like this show, if you like what we do here, if you watch these episodes, please just hit that subscribe button. It means the world. Let's get on with it. <laughs> Seth, you've had an incredible twisting, turning career. And I have to say, when I was reading about your earliest years, an unexpected one in many respects. To me too. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do I need to know about, um, about you, where you came from, how you were raised to understand the man that you are? I mean, I, I get that depends on your appetite, I guess. Um, uh, I don't think anyone needs to know anything. But if uh, if you're curious, um, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot. Uh, I uh, I think a general uh, when I look at my life, I guess I started young. I think that's something that I uh, I I kind of view as one of like the defining traits and characteristics uh, uh, of my life. And I think uh, I've always worked very hard uh, and I've always had very supportive parents. And I think those things all uh, uh, are things that when, if you're looking at like, if you're, if you're curious about how I got to where I am from like a career standpoint, I think, and just like who I am as a person in a lot of ways, I think those, those things were instrumental. Yeah. Your parents. Yeah. I was reading about them. Yeah, they're very strange people. Yeah. <laughs> How so? I mean, everyone's parents are strange to them, I would imagine. I would, uh, yeah, they're just, they're kind of, uh, you know, my dad's kind of eccentric. My mother's uh, also kind of eccentric. <laughs> um, you know, they, uh, but again, they were very, they're both incredibly supportive. Uh, I think because they're eccentric, I think a lot of, you know, my writing partner, Evan, his parents were much less eccentric by kind of more traditional metrics and were much less supportive of uh, of his career in a lot of ways. And so uh, I probably benefited from their, you know, uh, eccentricities more than anything. Yeah. Eccentrics are a broad word. What does it? Because I could, I could describe my parents. Specifically, one of them is being eccentric. But yeah. When you say eccentric, what, what exactly do you mean? Um, I mean... My dad, well, my whole family, you know, I'm, uh, you know, like a lot, I, my, my grandmother was like a, an immigrant um, who fled uh, World War I. A lot of Jewish families are defined by the fact that people uh, have been trying to kill Jewish people for a very long time. And my family is no different. Um, a lot of the reasons Jews live where they live and are where they are and not, you know, in you know, Eastern Europe somewhere is because 
uh, you know, people were trying to kill them. And that also shapes, I think, uh, Jewish sensibility to a large degree. I know it did mine because uh, it's kind of informed by uh, neuroses and uh, trauma to a large degree. Um, and uh, so, yeah, my grandmother is an immigrant and um, she met my grandfather, uh, who uh, his parents were immigrants to uh, Winnipeg, which is a very cold, unforgiving part of Canada. Um they moved to Vancouver ultimately and had my mother. Um, and my mother wanted to go to Israel to travel. My dad's from Newark, New Jersey, which is um, like, especially where he's from, like one of the worst parts of America <laughs> um, from like a, a kind of crime standpoint, especially at that time in the 70s and 80s. Um, and he, my dad's like a, so, uh, you know, a socialist <laughs> and moved to a kibbutz in Israel where him and my parents, uh, him and my mother met and then moved uh, to Canada. So my dad has always been like incredibly left wing, um, especially both my parents, but my dad really like he would have, he would have stayed like essentially living on like a commune his whole life. Uh, if you know, he never met my mother basically. Yeah. Um, and he has like incredible kind of like, I guess it's OCD. <laughs> I don't know if it's a disorder. I would say he has obsessive compulsive, uh, tendencies. Um, and, uh, yeah, and he has Tourette syndrome, uh, so he's twitchy, and uh, and I, I have it as well to some degree. But those are connected, uh, kind of compulsive, uh, you know, compulsion and, and Tourette's. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, no shortage of strangeness to draw from when uh, in my family. <laughs> what was his um, relationship like with money? Um, I'd say <laughs> not not that relevant. I mean, yeah, we I was not money was I think. We did not, I did not grow up with a lot of money. You know, um, my parents, my mother uh, went to school to be a social worker when I was very young and then became a social worker. But when I was like a kid, she was a cashier at a, uh, you know, a, a department store. And my dad was, uh, worked at like a vocational college as an ombudsman, which uh, kind of, you know, is like a swing position in, to some degrees, help facilitates life on the uh, on the campus, you know. A lot of time was spent working in the game room from my memory. Uh, so yeah, we grew up, you know, in a small apartment. And then, um, so yeah, I think some people who don't grow up with a lot of money, I think are taught to really like revere money and kind of uh, put a lot of emphasis on it. And I think other people who don't grow up with a lot of money uh, kind of are taught that it's not that important. And as long as you have enough to do certain things, then then that's enough. And it's not something that you should like fetishize or, um you know, make the be all end all by any means. And I was definitely more raised like that. Yeah. Is there some, sometimes a, a bit of a paradox when your parents um, don't value money and maybe they sometimes struggle with it that you grow up trying to avoid that struggle? Definitely. I for sure had some things when I was young where I was afraid of being broke. And I'm sure that for sure informed <laughs> elements of my ambition. You know, I'm very lucky in that it also coincided with a very strong like creative drive you know um but i definitely yeah remember being very concerned that we didn't have enough money and my parents not being that concerned that we didn't have enough money which probably made me more concerned that we didn't have enough money because i was like why aren't they worried we don't have enough money um so yeah that was that was something that was kind of, but then uh, that was when i was like very young and then as i got older i saw that uh, you know, uh, when I got into high school and stuff, I saw that it, we, I would be fine. You know what I mean? Uh, on, the, on the grand scale of things. <laughs> In that apartment, when you were quote unquote very young, if I'd asked you, if I'd said, Seth, what are you, uh, what are you going to be when you're older? What would you have responded to me? Um, I mean, I probably would have said, I want to write movies or something like that. I really? probably would have wanted to be a ninja up until a certain <laughs> age, uh, a ninja turtle specifically, probably. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, I remember uh, when I was probably like six or seven years old is when I started to really want to, like the idea of making movies became very like fascinating to me. And I was one of those kids with a camera who was like running around making movies. I was obsessed with movies, quoting movies. I wanted to watch all I want to do is watch movies. I like, I love, I like fell in love with movies at a, at a very young age. Yeah. Was there an influence in your household that 
inspired that love for movies. My parents love movies. They're like huge movie fans. Um, they would go to movies. Again, it was one of those things like we did not have a lot of money. We would go to movies all the time. And uh, in Vancouver, Tuesdays was like the cheap movie night for whatever reason. It's a slow night. So maybe they incentivize customers. And almost every Tuesday, we as a family would go to whatever new movie had come out that week. So we saw, I saw everything in theaters, like constantly. And I loved it. Um, and my parents, you know, had a VCR and would take movies off of television. And we had this, you know, I think a lot of, uh, you know, people my age are kind of defined also by like those VHS tapes that you grew up with because it was like a finite amount of movies. And then I went to high school, me and Evan, across the street from two uh, video rental stores, a Blockbuster and a Rogers, which was like the Canadian competitor. But we would go there every day after school and just like walk the hour uh, aisles and for hours and rent movies. We go there on the weekends and rent talk, walk the aisles and rent movies. Like we were, um, and yeah, ever since I was young and then I met my writing partner, who became my producing partner, directing partner, Evan, when I was 12. So I was very young, but ever since, ever since then, I can remember, I was like obsessed with movies basically. Yeah. And stand up that came in at 12 years old as well. Roughly. Yeah. You know, for me, I loved comedy in general and I love stand up comedy. My parents were big stand up comedy fans, but truthfully, it was kind of like a means to an end to me because I, I get it's funny because it's like it was like weirdly well thought out for being 12 or 13 years old <laughs> but i was like oh if i do stand-up comedy at that time sitcoms were very popular seinfeld things like that so i was like i was like the most practical path for me to have some sort of success doing this is i'll start doing stand-up comedy maybe i can get an agent and then maybe i can like get on a sitcom and be like you know, Ray Romano or Jerry Seinfeld or something like that. And then maybe I can write movies and that can like turn into a movie career basically. And that was like, if you were to ask me when I was like 12 years old, like, what is your life going to be like? That's what I would have hoped it would be like, you know? Remarkable because most 12 year olds. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking like that. What, yeah. what, was, what was school? What was your relationship like with school? Was there any influence there on you as a man today, that early relationship with school in your peers? For sure. I mean, the first movie I wrote was super bad with Evan and it was very much informed by our high school experience. It's largely based on real things that happened. I would say the educational aspects of school were, was lost on me. And, and I, from a very young age knew that my ultimate, uh, life path did not, it was not gonna, you know, follow, you know, an academic route, you know, um, and, and my parents never put that much emphasis on it, honestly. Like, they weren't like, you have to, my dad dropped out of college, you know, that they weren't like, you have to do this, you know? I think more than anything, they actually saw that I was like, very inspired to do comedy and I loved movies and they saw I was willing to work very, uh, willing to work very hard from a very young age. And so, um, honestly, from the time I entered high school, which was when I was 13, they were like, they didn't care that much that I was not doing that well in high school because from because I was always working really hard on writing movies and doing stand-up comedy, uh, like from around that time uh until I got a little older. But like they saw I wasn't like lazy. I was just motivated to do something other than school. But the culture of school I loved and the things that happened at school I loved. And I thought the kids I went to school with were hilarious and and we would go to parties every weekend and people's parents would be out of town and we were trying to hook up with girls and buy beer and our friends were getting licenses and fake IDs and all this shit. And, and I thought it was awesome and, and hilarious. And, and I went to like a public high school in like a big city, you know, like um, there was like 3000 kids at my school. Vancouver is a real big metropolitan city with downtowns and so, you know, neighborhoods and the good area, the bad, like, you know, you could really get into trouble in Vancouver. So um, it, it provided a lot of like adventures, you know, and, and I loved it. And, and, and I wasn't one of those people, Evan either. It's not like we were popular or cool or anything, but we weren't like tortured by high school. We were like, this is a fun adventure and we can have fun here. And, um, and especially if we don't put too much stakes on the actual, like, doing well here <laughs> part of it <laughs> adam at 15 years old you went to a canadian comedy festival do you remember i'm sure you remember yeah that. um yeah i entered like a competition i think it was yeah um and uh yeah and i did pretty well i i placed pretty well in the in the competition i was okay i was pretty good at stand-up comedy like it, it, it was uh yeah 
Do you remember the instance where Jerry Seinfeld sh showed up? Yes, I do. I, I came, that was actually, I was auditioning to get into the Just for Laughs Festival in Los Angeles. And I show up and it's during the day, which is not great. There's not that many people there. It's maybe like five o'clock. Not a good time to stand up comedy. I'm like 15 years old. And I, fly, I flew in for this, you know, um, there's comics going up and doing their thing. There's like the scout from the Just for Laughs Festival there. And like, I'm about to go up and I'm next, and the MC is about to introduce me, and yeah, and someone comes over, and they're like, Jerry Seinfeld is about to show up, and he's going to go up instead of you, and I was like, what? I'm like, I'm here to, for, I'm here to audition for this thing, and they're like, yeah, well, he'll go up, and then you'll go up after, and I'm like, I'm going to go on after Jerry Seinfeld, uh, and they're like, yes, and so he goes up, he like, I mean, he's a, his show is still on, like, he's as famous as, as you can, as a comedy star, as there is alive at that moment. And it's what you're hoping. It's like you go to a stand up comedy club at that time, hoping Jerry Seinfeld will come in. And then it happened. And these people, like, it's like they won the lottery and he comes and he just like annihilates. And then he gets off stage and then they're like, and now, like, from Vancouver, 15-year-old Seth Rogen. And uh, yeah, and I bombed horribly. Um, and I did not get into the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival. <laughs> <laughs> and I told Jerry Seinfeld that story and he was uh, completely uninterested. <laughs> <laughs> he could have cared less. <laughs> it's, it seems like a tough thing for a 15-year-old, a, a pretty horrific firing line for a 15-year-old to put themselves in, stand-up comedy. Yeah, I think part of it, honestly, was informed by like my night, my overall like naivete to some degree. But I also, I, yeah, I, I was, I was good enough at it that it instantly wasn't like a viscerally painful experience. You know what I mean? And it, it's probably, you know, I played some sports in high school, but it, it was probably a similar. I imagine it's a similar mentality where you're like, yeah, there's stakes to this and there's ups and downs to this, but overall I'm good at it and I seem to be moving, mm. progressing in the right direction. So it's worth the the stress of it in order to to pursue it, you know? Um, and at times it's phenomenal and as, as fun as you would hope anything would be, you know? Um, but also, honestly, what was more fun was at that time me and Evan started to write super bad and that was like what I really loved doing. And like, I like doing stand up comedy and writing stand up jokes, but like, I loved sitting with Evan and writing a movie. And to me, that was like, at the time, it's frustrating because you're like, will this ever get made? Is this pointless? Are we wasting our time? Is this just a silly pursuit? But it was still, it was, I just loved it, you know? There's this through line in all your sort of creative work often, which is about like making people laugh. Yeah. Have you ever figured out like why, you know, because I've sat here with a lot of comedians. And I've and it, and it, there always seems to be something about comedians where, I don't know, some instance when they you know maybe they're younger or some kind of inspiration in their life which made them somewhat compelled to, and and in, and almost in, energized by the pursuit of making other people laugh and happy. Have you ever? Does that resonate with you? And have you ever identified where that comes from in you? That pursuit of making people laugh and happy. Um, I think for me, I don't. I, I don't I like, I think some comedians have like a dark origin story. You know what mm. I mean? Um, I don't, you know, um, I think for me, it was like something I liked and something I was good at and something that I was very like encouraged and, and fostered to do from a very young age. And I was lucky enough to find another guy my age who was as good at it as I was and as interested uh, at, at doing it as I was, which is like miraculous. Like I had a lot of like, you know, I read part of that Malcolm Gladwell book and I'm not, you know, <laughs> about the, uh, <laughs> uh, about, you know, the miraculous kind of set of circumstances that it takes to become like remotely successful in this terrible world of ours. You know what I mean? And like, I think it was things like my parents were big comedy fans. So I saw comedy from a very young age. I'm from Canada, which is like a place that acclaims comedy and respects comedy. So culturally, I'm like from a place where comedy is like, you know, a relevant part of the culture, you know, um, Canadians, some of their biggest like exports are comedians and comedy shows. Lauren Michaels is Canadian, you know, SCTV. 
you know, a lot of uh, great, uh, some of the greatest comedians of all time are, are Canadian, you know? Um, and so it, it's something that was always kind of just always a part of like the DNA of being a Canadian person, I think to some degree as well. Also, I'm from Vancouver where they made movies, not to say it's like I grew up in Hollywood, but like they, you would see movie sets around, you would see, I went to a high school, they shot some movies at the high school because it was a very like cinematic looking high school. So you would see trucks and stuff like that. I didn't know anyone who worked in the entertainment industry, but like you kind of would see it around. So it, it made it a little more obtainable. And if we lived like in the middle of fucking nowhere and it just seemed like completely abstract, you know what I mean? So I think that, I think that like my path is honestly one of like being supported and and being and working hard and being very diligent, but also like having an environment that kind of like bolstered my ambition. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 16 years old, you, you get a part in Freaks and Geeks. Yeah. And that brings you to LA with your family. Yeah. <laughs> what, your, your entire family came to LA? Well, my parents, my sister parents. was in college, yeah. <laughs> and I read that they'd lost their jobs at around that time. Yes. And that made you the sole breadwinner in the house. Basically, yes. <laughs> what, did that feel like pressure? Um, being 16 years old and being the breadwinner for your house because your parents have lost their jobs. In a way, it felt like an alleviation of pressure because after six, I remember my dad telling me like after, after like three months or six months of being on Freaks and Geeks, he's like, you've made more money in this time than I've made my entire life put together. So like, like it, it, if anything was like, an amazing alleviation of uh, of a weight because there was money all of a sudden. For the first time in our lives, things could be paid for e easily, you know? And so I was more than happy to provide for everybody because I suddenly had access to an amount of money that was like absurd compared to the amount of money I grew up with access to or anyone in my family grew up with with access to you know your work ethic which i've read about over and over again throughout your book and throughout various interviews you've done seems to be pretty spectacular and one of the quotes that i read is if there were any kind of dark driving force behind um your early ambitions quote it would be some sense of financial insecurity yeah probably <laughs> but that that's gone <laughs> which is maybe why i don't make as many things as i used to <laughs> that's um that's a that's an interesting journey to go on being driven by having that sort of financial insecurity developing a real sort of really yeah. strong relationship with work and then that falling away yeah and it fell away pretty fast i think honestly like i think by the time i you know, there was a point. So yeah, I was on Freaks and Geeks uh, and then undeclared. And then I didn't work for years. But by then, it felt like my parents were like incapable of making enough money to survive on their own also. So like once I had some money, like they, it was just bonus money. You know what I mean? Like uh, part of what had happened is they lost their jobs and we lived in a house. So we sold our house in Vancouver and, and that's why everyone moved to LA. So there was like a little more money available because we had sold our house. So like, it's not like my parents were like just like a, you know, a, a leech on, uh, you know, they, 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 they were able to like make a baseline level of like survivable income. So when I had more money, it, it, it just, um, yeah, it kind of just added a, a, a cushion of comfort. And then there were times, then they moved back to Canada um, when I was like 18 and I was in LA and that's around when I became unemployed for years and years. So I did then start to have financial burden, but it was like a soul fight, you know, it was my own financial burden. And, and it was not, I did not feel like I was letting my whole family down or not, you know, providing for my whole family. It was more, I just myself was like, oh, I might have to move. I might have to move back in with my family because I might not be able to afford to live in Los Angeles uh, for longer. Cause I was unemployed for, years basically yeah you were unemployed for years and years yeah um after that that first role on freaks and geeks yeah we did freaks and geeks and we did a show called undeclared that was on fox in 2000 yeah. 2001 and then then i basically didn't work for like three years essentially yeah <laughs> what's going through your you, you know you're pro presumably doing auditions and stuff like that yeah does it ever like what's that phase like of unemployment most people quit at that point that's the point where you say fuck this that didn't even occur to me i i uh, i did not um I was getting 
I was pretty kind of had like a chip on my shoulder uh, to some degree. I was writing a lot still, you know, um, we were still, that's probably when we wrote Pineapple Express, you know, so we had finished super bad. No one wanted to make it, um, <laughs> but we thought it was good. So we kind of put it on the shelf. We're like, let's write another movie. Um, and then we wrote uh, Pineapple Express. So we were busy and we thought it was awesome. And we thought both the movies were awesome. And in general, we were also getting like very positive feedback as writers. We just weren't getting like hired to do anything and no one would make our movie. So it was it, it was this weird mixture of things kind of being like encouraging and and very frustrating at the same time. And 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 that's almost like the worst part about kind of being in that part of your career, which is the part of the career most people who live in Hollywood are in, which is one where it's like any given phone call is one that is like making your fucking life or one that is a yet another door slamming in your face that you have to like just suck up and keep moving forward. You know what I mean? And and so that that's happening a lot at that time. Um, yeah, and seeing your friends also start to do very well and start to <laughs> make things, you know, that is, uh, it's very encouraging in some ways, but you inherently get very jealous and you start to doubt yourself and you start to doubt if you are good enough to um, do it or if anyone will ever like see in your, see in you what you see in yourself, you know? Um, but yeah, it, it's, you know, Though it's pretty warm in L in LA usually, so it's easy to just hang out and keep plugging along. <laughs> What's your um? You use the word doubt yourself there. What's your journey been with been with self doubt? People would obviously look at you and assume that you have zero self doubt because you've been so successful. What you've done. <laughs> um, I think I think all creative people and people who have creative pursuits in their life have self doubt. Like it's impossible to put yourself out there. I think from my experience and from meeting all the creative people I've met in my life from people who, you know, it's their first day on set, you know, and, and they have one line to Steven Spielberg. They all have self doubt. They're all worried. People won't like what they're doing, that people are going to think it's stupid, that they're going to think they're stupid for wanting to do it, that they're going to, just reject it and 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 by proxy reject them you know um that is like that is from my experience pretty constant across the board for all creative types who genuinely like care about what they do <laughs> i'm sure there are some people who technically like are maybe actors or something and and do not have any of that but they're probably not very good and don't care that much about what they do you know what i mean mm -hmm. um, but in general from my experience i would say that applies to to creative people is self-doubt and and for me it's it comes in waves you know you have a, you make a thing everyone likes gets a little better. You make a thing everyone fucking hates, it gets a little worse. Uh, you know, it, you know, and, and, uh, and that's a part of also doing what, you know, I do is like, you get, you know, like there, you know, it's, it's like, you know, I'm a, it's funny. I was saying to someone I work with the other day, like, I'm not, I'm at the point. It's funny in my career. where like, not a lot of people are in a position to like yell at me in my job, but like the New York Times will like publish an entire article like saying I I suck at my job. <laughs> and so like that's the trade-off is like I've worked my way up to not having to deal with that much like personal conflict and face-to-face -face conflict, but I will have like a, just like a cultural institution tell everyone that I suck, you know? And so that that's kind of like that that will add self-doubt, uh, things like that, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, and so it it's for me it's for me something that's present, but it, I, I try not to let it stop me from doing the things that I think are interesting and, and, uh, and the things that I think I would enjoy watching, you know, um, has it ever hurt you? Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, what, like, uh, what self doubt? I'd say you a know, lack of self doubt has maybe hurt me at times. <laughs> I mean, like the, the criticism, like someone, Oh someone yeah, of course it hurts everyone. Yes. Very much so. Um, I think if most critics knew how much it hurt the people that uh, that made the things that they are writing about, uh, they would second guess the <laughs> the way they write these things. <laughs> like it's devastating. 
It takes years. I know people who never recover from it, honestly. Years, year, decades of, of being hurt by, because it's very personal, you know? It, it's not like, it's not, it, it is personal, you know? Um, and so it is devastating when you are being like institutionally told that your personal expression was bad. Like that is like devastating, you know? And something that people carry with them uh, literally their entire life. And and I get why it fucking sucks. <laughs> you know, I read it. I was reading through various moments in your life where, I mean, you've had back to back to back successes, so it's hard to find. Some <laughs> to so. That's definitely not true. <laughs> no, you have. You seem to. I mean, from the bird's eye view, you look at your work, yeah. your portfolio, and you go, I "This is." I've been trending well. Yeah, but... you've been trending well. <laughs> the thing you talk about, and you've, you've spoken about in interviews, is is Green Hornet, where yeah. you got you received some critical reviews for that. Can you zoom me? If I was a fly on the wall in one of those moments where you've received that feedback is coming in and it's coming in you know critically what what would i see if i was a fly on the wall in your home like what are you, does it do you stay in your bed do you you like what's the, the the human impact it has on you it's different things and i think there's different you know and, and that's another funny thing about making movies is like and having like and just being like a person who works a lot is like life goes on like you could be making another movie as your movie is bombing, which is a funny thing because it, it's it's bittersweet because like you you know that things will be okay. You're already you're already working. You know what I mean? If the fear is the movie bombs and you won't get hired again, well, you don't have to worry about that. You're already you've been hired. It's too late. You know, um, but it's an emotional <laughs> wait conundrum at times. Just to, just dealing with that and navigating that. You know. Um, for Green Hornet, it's fine. Literally, yeah, like the critics were, the, the reviews were coming out and it was pretty bad and people just kind of like hated it. Like it seemed like a thing people just were taking like joy and disliking a lot. You know what I mean? Um, but it was, it opened to like $35 million, which was like, I think at the time, the biggest opening weekend I'd ever been associated with in any capacity. And so it was also like, it did pretty well. And that's, and it was a funny thing where it really didn't, that one and, and that's what's nice sometimes is like you you do get you know you can grasp for some sense of success at times you know and 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 uh but i honestly think things like the interview were more like painful uh, as far as like people really taking joy and talking shit about it and and uh and uh really kind of questioning you know the types of people that would want to make a movie like that in general. Like, I think, yeah, that felt far more personal. I think Green Hornet felt like I just had fallen victim to like, which was true. Like, like, you know, I, uh, a big fancy thing, which was like a super, and, and we were just kind of like, also like ahead of the curve a little bit too much, I think as well to some degree, like we were early on that, on that wave, you know? And so I think that was easier to deal with in a lot of ways. Cause it was like, not so much like a creative failure on our parts, but more like a conceptual failure. I think uh, like the interview, people more treated us like we had creatively failed, uh, which sucked much worse. Uh, and that's happened a few times. Yeah, where people really act like we've just, uh, and again, it's not, that, I'm not gonna act like this is that bad. Like this is not on the grand scale of things in life. It's not that bad. <laughs> like, and I've gotten much better at dealing with it as well. And I think when I was younger, I really like, did not have as much perspective as I do. And now I am not, I do not carry it with me nearly as much as I used to, you know? Um, yeah. It's like, it is the center of your world though, these things, because you've poured your creative heart into, into mm -hmm. something. So it is you. It's oh like, yeah. It's like, it feels like a personal rejection. It's like very like much attached to yourself. Oh yeah. Like. It feels like a very personal rejection. And it Which, doesn't, and it doesn't feel like constructive. <laughs> it feels what's the, what's the human <laughs> impact there. What's like the human. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Sometimes you try, you try different things. Sometimes you go out to dinner where you just try to forget about it. Sometimes you sit there and watch movies. Sometimes you're literally just like sitting on the couch, fucking pissed and devastated. Um, I've had different approaches. I used, sometimes I would go to the beach. I, I used, used to have a house on the beach and I would go to the beach the weekends. My movies came out. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, any opening weekend, honestly, and any time I have a thing coming out, it sucks because it just is stressful. It's like birth, like it, it, which is just an inherently painful process, even though it is 
maybe bringing something beautiful into the world, it is a painful act. And I think that is like what releasing a movie is for the people who made it is like, in some ways it's inherently painful. And, and in some ways it's inherently beautiful and joyous, but in some ways it's also just very painful. <laughs> this is the story of creativity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Making anything that you care about that is slightly challenging or original or new risks both exceptional success, but also um, potential fail, like potential yeah. And failure. the more personal it is, it's like the more the the higher the highs can be if it works, and the lower the lows are if if it doesn't. So you know, the more the more personal the rejection feels. Yeah, a lot of people can relate to that. I know for sure. <laughs> that that period, say after you receive feedback on the interview, yeah. how long is that process of trying to like get back on your feet and get it out of your head and stop it occupying your mind? I mean. It's interesting. Like, I think it, it's different and it rears its head in different ways. And I think like imposter syndrome or self-doubt or, you know, this phenomenon where like the more you know about a thing, the less you feel you know about it in some ways and vice versa. Um, you know, I think that is something, again, that is like a common theme in creative people's lives the fact that you read about it all the time is is comforting honestly because you're like oh it's it's a thing it's out there you know um but to me it's never been that hard to to do the creatively risky thing and it's never been that hard for me to convince myself to like take the leap and do the thing that is maybe crazy and do the thing that is a big swing and 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 to put myself out there and i think that's also what's good I guess about being rejected enough times is you kind of like you see like it sucks but you can survive it and so it's ultimately worth trying to do it again you know and 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 it, even the worst case scenario is survivable if you just keep going uh from a creative standpoint you know what I mean so I think uh that's also like yeah uh we're yeah, we haven't stopped. It, it, it'll nag at you at times. But if anything, my biggest fear is to make a thing that's like fucking boring or not taking a big swing or doesn't seem like it's trying to push things forward or, 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 or like it's just like happy to relax. And, you know, like I, I think like the fact that we get to make anything, movies, TV shows, it's like there are so many people who are trying to do it and we get to do it. So like we we should fucking go for it. And we're spending the money of these giant fucking conglomerate corporations. Like they're letting us spend millions of dollars to make our crazy things. Like we should go for it. Like we should really look back and be like, wow, like, can you fucking believe we did that? We, that we spent hundreds of millions of Amazon's dollars doing that, you know, like, like that, that's what's exciting. So, um, yeah, it's something that like nags at you, but I think luckily for me and I, and it's who I'm surrounded by, you know, to some degree as well. But like, we've always, you know, there's moments where you doubt yourself and you kind of bobble, but I've had always someone being like, fuck it, let's do it, you know? <laughs> I get the sense, funnily enough, from just the couple of minutes we spent together that you, you have no, like you almost don't, you're such a lover of what you do at heart that, you almost couldn't not do it. Like, oh, yeah. I, so here's a question then. If I told you today that you could no longer make movies or do anything in the entertainment or creative space. That would be hard. I'd become a ceramicist. <laughs> <laughs> Which I do spend a lot of time doing. I know. So. I've read it. <laughs> it was uh, quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it would be a real bummer though. <laughs> what, would, what, would, what would actually your life be? Um. I mean, I wouldn't, it would, I could, I, I, it's tough to think of because it is very like ingrained with who I am and, and what I do. And like, and it is like, I could stop working. I have enough money to, if I didn't want to keep working, I could, I could never work again and live the exact life I live now until I die. You know, um, it, I have no kids. I'm not trying to leave generational wealth to anybody. Like I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, like we could just keep going. It, it, it's genuinely cause like I enjoy it and it's, a, and it's a part of who I am and how I spend my day and, and what I love doing. And, and people generally seem to enjoy the output, which I enjoy. And, and it seems to be additive to the, 
creative landscape of film and television, the things that I get to be a part of, you know? And so, um, yeah, it, it's, but it, I, it mostly comes down to, I just like doing it. And so it would be hard to think of what else I would do because like on it, like I, I just write, I love, I enjoy writing and I've been doing it since I, I've been writing like, you know, screenplays since I was 12 years old, <laughs> you know, I'm 40. So it's like, it's so much a part of who I am that like, I do it all the time. If I have, I'm generally working on a few things. If I'm making up a coffee and have five minutes, like I'll, I'll write for a few minutes. Like, uh, you know, I, I, I genuinely enjoy it. So it, it would be hard to imagine. I wouldn't, I don't know what I would do. <laughs> You're, um, you have ADHD. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I'm I, pretty good at focusing, honestly. I read that. Um, I read that you had Tourette's and ADHD. I do. Have, oh yeah. I guess Tourette's. I mean, maybe I'm more Tourette's. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, 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 some Tourette's like, yeah, some Tourette's, which is connected to ADHD. Yeah. I guess, yeah. What has that ever had a, a role in your life? Does, is it been causal at all? Um, I don't fully understand Tourette's if I'm com being completely honest. I don't, well, it's kind of uh, connected to like a compulsion uh, disorder where you, it's like, it, it manifests in like physical uh, tics and twitches. Um, the most extreme versions are like people, you know, screaming like, you know, swear words and shit like that. But it all roots from like a compulsion to do it. Um, and like, it's like scratching an itch. That's the best way I can describe it. I'm sure you've been sitting across from people who, twitch or have a weird eyebrow thing they're doing or a weird thing they're doing you know what i mean and i see it so often and that is that is a mild case of Tourette syndrome and i think so many people have it who are undiagnosed and i know the exact feeling those people have when they are doing that and it literally feels like you have an itch on your hand and you're scratching it and it's the same thing from like a musculature like movement standpoint you feel like if you don't cock up your eyebrow you're not scratching that itch and when you do you're like oh i did it and you and, have that uh yeah at times i for me it was always pretty mild physically but i still it does i i feel the urge at times but i'm very good at not doing it <laughs> As you might know, the show's now sponsored by Airbnb. Absolutely love Airbnb, always have, always been a, you know, saved my life on so many occasions. And my team, when we first got in touch with Airbnb, were talking about how most people don't realize that their place where they currently live could become an Airbnb. And I guess the second question there is, how much could your place be worth? And it turns out you could be sitting on an Airbnb gold mine without even knowing it. Some people Airbnb their entire homes when they're away. That's what I did in New York. Whenever I left New York, my place was on Airbnb and people rented it out, sometimes for a day, sometimes for two days, sometimes for a week. And it's a great way to cover some of the bills while you're away. So whether you're looking to go on holiday or you just want some extra cash for bills, or you wanna buy something nice for a Valentine that you love, whatever it might be, Head over to airbnb.co.uk slash host and you can find out how much your current property where you live can earn while you're not there. I suspect it might blow your mind because it certainly blew mine. What, you know, all that success you've had, all those movies you named recently that you, you know, some of them of which are coming out soon. You know, I, having spoken to you today, I get work ethic. I get your innate passion, which seems to have been there since you were a child. But, I, but there's people that have both of those things and they're not Seth Rogen. You know what I mean? So is there anything else when you look back on your life? You talked about the circumstance, your mother's, your, you know, being around that culture. Is there anything about you in particular, a talent? And people find this hard to answer because it requires you to say something nice about yourself. But, and so celebrities often say, you know, <laughs> say, oh no, this, you know. But is there any, what is it that makes you good at what you do? Um, I think I... I think I think, man, I honestly think because I grew up watching so many movies, um, and having parents that appreciated them. Um, I, from a very young age, had an inherent understanding of cinematic storytelling, of what, and that specifically from a writing standpoint, from how the movies were written. That is, for whatever reason, how my brain processed it. How the characters were introduced, how the conflicts 
between them were <laughs> set up, how they played out throughout the movie, how they resolved themselves or didn't resolve themselves throughout the movie, how they manifested and set pieces and sequences that exemplified the conflicts and the themes and the and the, the tensions between the characters. For whatever reason, from a very young age, I was able to understand and write those things. And I, you know, I look back now as like a 40-year-old person who has produced and helped countless people with their screenplays and written countless screenplays. Like there are things about like what we put into super bad as like 14 year olds that are like fundamentally functional and good in a way that is like beyond uh, like the average 14 year olds ability, the average, the average writer's ability in a lot of ways, you know, um, like, and, and that is something that, me and Evan really just, we were lucky. <laughs> like, we we got it. And, and I think, honestly, as an actor, I mostly credit my ability to act as my, from like a right, through a writing lens. And I think as an actor, I understand what the story needs. I understand, I understand how that character needs to affect things, what that character needs to do in order for this story to be told effectively. I don't view my acting as internally as the other actors I work with. I, I know it, I see it, I talk to them about it all the time. I view it much more from like a big picture, like, okay, here's the role this character plays in the story. How do I make that work as well as it possibly could? You know, um, and I can do it. So I, I have some performance ability, which not everyone does, but I think, I think I am, I think my understanding of how story works kind of helps compensate for my, the fact that I'm not the greatest actor and that I am able to work with actors who are much better than I am, honestly. Um, but I think if I had to answer that question, which I'm uncomfortable doing, uh, that is how I would answer it is for whatever reason, me and I found a guy with the same skill, which is like miraculous. But like from a young age, me and another guy had a very inherent sense of like how to write a movie, basically. There's a young creative listening to this now, sat in their bedroom or driving in their car, pushing their pram, walking their dog, whatever. And they, they're a creative in whatever industry. It could be DJing or, you know, author. They could be an actor. Yeah. What is the actionable advice that you could give to them to, to you know, give them a shot of, because there's a lot of creatives out there that are struggling. Yeah. And you you would have had this bird's eye view on creators that end up being successful, you know, in their careers and those that maybe have the talent, but don't end up getting there. Is there anything actionable that you can say to them that would help them end up in the talented, successful group? Um, unfortunately, the only way to mitigate not being successful is to not quit. That's it. If you don't quit, you might make it. And if you quit, you definitely won't <laughs> and and honestly i think after all the years i've seen people make it and not make it the only common denominator is is that like i've seen actors write themselves off be like i'm never gonna fucking do this try to get other jobs one of my dear friends who's an actor he's been an actor he's a great actor a brilliant actor and his career ebbs and flows, comes and goes. He'll star on a TV show for a few years. He won't work for two years. He went and tried to get a job at like a car dealership one day. And I was like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> like, and he's like, I, I, I can't, I've quit acting. No one's gonna fucking hire me again. I'm unhirable. Now he's like, like the star of the most successful play on Broadway right now. And like, because he just got this role a couple of years after that. And he's in uh, one of the, biggest movies that's coming out next year he's in it like and 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 it's because he didn't actually quit he he kept going you know and it's not you know especially hollywood it's not a fair industry it, it is not fair who makes it. it the best people don't make it you know it's very luck oriented it's very connections oriented um i'm lucky like and i also worked hard and thank god i you know, have, I'm, I'm a good enough writer that I've been able to have enough longevity in my career once I got lucky, but like a lot of luck played into my success, you know? But that being said, I've seen people get lucky very at random times through random ways 
I was thinking about like Ian McKellen. Like, did you, had you heard of him before he was 65 years old? Like that guy, I didn't like, as I had never fucking heard the words Ian McKellen until he was Magneto and X-Men. Then all of a sudden he's like in Lord of the Rings. He's been one of the most famous people on earth. He got famous when he's like 60. Like, like that's what happens to people sometimes. You know what I mean? It, it's like, you never know, you know? And so I think that is, is what's interesting is, and if you like it, then just don't quit. And as long as you have enough to survive, then just keep trying to do it, you know? But there's gotta be something that I can do to increase my luck. Be, you know? be really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I think making, being nice, honestly, being nice, being the type of person people wanna be around, that people like, that people, if it comes down to it, wanna help instead of not help, that is very good. Like I've seen that just if people don't like being around you, then, then, then you will fail because you need other people to help you succeed. You know, um, working hard is like something you can control in a very uncontrollable world I find. And like, um, you know, it's funny. I was meeting with uh, someone recently who like ascended very high in Hollywood and she was like, I always fetishized hard work like to me that was like it like it, it, it like if you weren't working hard I like had no regard for you basically and like and to me that was like and and that's a good reminder of like those are the people you're up against and that was something that I always knew from a young age was like I I don't consider myself a competitive person but I knew succeeding in Hollywood was inherently a competitive pursuit. There's only so many jobs and there's way more motherfuckers trying to get their job, those jobs than there are jobs available. So by the nature of that, I was competing with people for these jobs. And I knew I had to be able to look at myself and be like, am I at least working harder than everyone else who is competing for this job? I might not be better than them or smarter than them or have as many connections as them or be as good looking as them or any of these things, but I can at least work harder than them, you know? Um, and that to me was something that was like controllable and I've never seen someone regret the amount of hard work they put into their pursuit. And so, you know, that that is something that will help you succeed, I think. Has, you, you referenced earlier, you don't have any kids. I do not. That has helped me succeed as well. <laughs> Definitely. Really? Oh yeah. Uh, there's a whole huge thing I'm not doing, which is raising children. <laughs> <laughs> would it, people obviously, someone would be listening, but yeah, but it would make you happier. You know, someone might say that. I'm trying to rebuttal. I don't think it would. I've been around obviously a lot of children. I'm not, I'm not ignorant to what it's like to, I've, I've seen everyone I know has kids. I, I see, I'm a, you know, I'm 40 again, you know, like it's not, I, I know, you know, I've, I've, some of my friends have had kids for decades, you know, um, some people want kids. Some people don't want kids. I think a lot of people have kids before they even think about it. From what I've seen, honestly, you just are told you go through life, you get married, you have kids. It's what happens. Um, and, and, me and my wife were just, neither of us were like that, you know? And um, honestly, the older we get, the more happy and reaffirmed we are with our choice to not have kids. Like it was something we kind of talked about more and we were like, have we made the right choice? Are we sure? Now, if more than anything, the conversation is like, honestly, thank God we don't have children. We get to do whatever we want. We are in our... We are, we are in the, the prime of our lives. We are smarter than we've ever been. We understand ourselves more than we ever have. We have the capacity to achieve a level of work and a level of communication and care for one another and a lifestyle we can live with one another that we've never been able to live before. And we can just do that. And we don't have to raise a child, which the, the world does not need right now <laughs> and so that was and so yeah it's uh we're, we're very happy uh, with our choice to not have kids and i just i work I, I i work with a lot of people with kids and i see definitively that i uh have more time to both do the things i need to do and the things i enjoy doing than they do <laughs> and not to say their kids don't bring them joy but 
I, I say this truthfully. I, 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 me and my wife seem to get a lot more active enjoyment out of not having kids than anyone I know seems to get out of having kids. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of your wonderful wife. Yes. <laughs> um, in my very extensive research, I found a series of photos. I found this one. Yes, that's my wife, Lauren. Exceptionally beautiful. She's lovely. And I found this one. Yes, that's Lauren and her mother. That's a great photo. Wow, it's like a real photo. It's a real photo. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you get this? <laughs> Internet. <laughs> that's amazing. Yes, this is Lauren and her mother, Adele. Who Adele passed away Mayan. a few years ago, yeah. You've campaigned exceptionally hard for Alzheimer's following um, Adele's diagnosis. Yeah. Can you tell me about that journey? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it's funny. It's like a celebrity, I guess, like, you know, I, you're kind of asked to do a lot of charity things and find like a cause, I think, you know, and there's, I think there's pressure to find a cause. And I think a lot of people adopt causes that are not organic to them and who they are. And, and they kind of find themselves, you know, uh, in the midst of a cause and, and, um, and that had happened to me in the past. I would go to some charity events and I always felt very out of uh, touch with it and, and didn't really understand it. And um, then uh, I met my wife and um, and this is in regards to the charity, but also in regards to just our relationship. I'd never been in a serious relationship ever in my life, really. Like a few months here and there I had dated, but never. And in uh, like 2005, I started dating my wife, Lauren, and she was the first serious relationship I ever had. Um, and very soon after we started dating is when she realized her mother seemed to be showing the first signs of Alzheimer's. And I knew nothing about that. It really, it was, it's not in my family. Um, and, and what I didn't understand is like, oh, it was a disease that had like no treatment, no cure. It was only going to steadily get worse until she died from it, which was, uh, uh, truly devastating and, put me and my wife on like a pretty intense journey for the next, you know, uh, 15 years or so basically. Um, and, uh, it, it really, uh, it really took a lot out of us and my wife, especially, you know, um, uh, Lauren felt very out of control and very devastated and really scrambling for like a outlet or in a way to gain some kind of agency over the situation. Um, yeah, and our friend uh, suggested we do a comedy show and maybe give the money to like an Alzheimer's charity, and we did, and it went very well. And my wife started telling her story as a, a young woman whose mother was in her fifties and diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and it was really not a thing like anyone was talking about at all. And she found there was like an enormous need for people to connect with someone who was going through this because a lot of people were going through it and really no one was talking about it, and. Um, we very, we kind of found like a need for this organization that we made HFC, which, um, became like, you know, an Alzheimer's charity that really was like focused on talking to young people. Um, many of whom were caretakers for their parents with Alzheimer's, you know, and, and again, it was just a thing. It's a very stigmatized disease and not a disease. Very many people are comfortable talking about at all. And, uh, yeah. And Lauren, as her mother progressed more and more, just talked about it more and more. And, uh, and it really, um, yeah, kind of made our charity more and more prominent in the space. And, um, yeah, has allowed us to do kind of more and more things to help people. You say people don't talk about it enough. And part of that is results in people thinking about Alzheimer's as just losing your keys or forgetting a sentence or something. Yeah. Um, what is the reality of Alzheimer's as you've observed it? Well, it's different for everyone, but it, it's inherently for my mother-in-law, like, she forgot how to speak, how to go to the bathroom, how to talk, uh, I mean, how to eat, how to walk, um, and was essentially like, you know, uh, someone you would move from the bed to the wheelchair, force feed, essentially, you move back to the bed. She was like that for like seven years or something like that. I think she didn't, uh, and again, I'm bad with years. She didn't speak for several years. Um, and... And it was, yeah, if you saw her, you wouldn't assume it was dementia or Alzheimer's. You would assume she had some like horrific stroke or something like that. It was not, it was not what I understood a like cognitive decline could, could cause, you know? Um, it was far more devastating. And, and yeah, and I think uh, people don't understand how kind of 
dire it is, or they do understand, and they just, again, don't like talking about it because it's really scary. And people are weird about their brains, mental health, obviously, in America especially. People are very weird about not a thing they like talking about. Um, and so, yeah, it kind of taps into a lot of things people are just scared of in general. I what think. toll does that have on the people around her, like yourself and your, your wife? Um, I mean, it was just devastating for my wife, especially like it was uh, truly one of the the most upsetting thing you could imagine is like very slowly seeing your mother die over the course of years and 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 years, you know, um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it caused, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was very grim, you know, um, but through the charity, you know, there was a lot of like kind of hope that came up at times and a lot of like, uh, you know, kind of like wonderful things that it felt like we were able to do as a result of it. So there was kind of bittersweet moments, but in general, it was terrible. Was that, is that, has that been one of the hardest times of your um, last couple of decades for you, that, that process? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, especially, you know, being married to someone who is going through something incredibly traumatic um is yeah is 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 you know it's hard for them and it's hard for you to know how to support them properly and and how to you know navigate their feelings in a you know uh productive <laughs> and loving way you know um and it's obviously much harder for them um and uh you know, it, it, it is, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it, it can be hard for everybody. Adele passed away 2020. Yeah. What impact does that have on the family? Um, I mean, in some ways it is, uh, a relief of burden, you know, especially with someone who was so sick for so long with no hope in sight for any for for any way to get better, you know? Um and and also like devastating, you know? And and it's something that I'm always having to not having to remind myself, but something I'm always reminding myself of is like, you know, your wife, her mother died recently. Like there's there's a lot going along with that. And and although there's like this constant thing that we are not dealing with, there is there is another thing, you know? Um and and again, in many ways, like the active agony of her mother kind of slowly dying was was probably worse. But this is also bad in its own way, you know? You mentioned Americans don't like talking about their mental health. Yeah. Or really anything cognitive related no. to their cognitive functions. <laughs> yeah. I've never heard you speak about your mental health. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that might be why. <laughs> Have you ever had anxiety? Uh, not I, really, not more than the average, you know. I often think of, I often think that the creatives over index with anxiety for kind of some of the reasons we talked about earlier. Yeah, I don't, I think I have anxiety, but it, I also am constantly reminding, I'm good, I think, at analyzing my own feelings and behavior to some degree. I do have anxiety sometimes, but I'm also having to remind myself that I am like, going through things that are objectively anxiety inducing to almost anyone. And I would probably be weird if I wasn't feeling some sort of anxiety with the amount of public facing uh, pressure uh, and exposure I have at times. Um, so you just tell yourself like, yeah, you feel you, uh, this is, you are feeling anxious right now because you are dealing with this thing that it has a lot of <laughs> public pressure on it, you know? Um, so I think in general, no, in general, I have pretty good mental health, I think. <laughs> it's, ask the people who work with me. <laughs> it's, it's an, it seems like an unhuman way to live, right? Being in the spotlight and being, being um, receptible to so much public feedback. Like you talked about how shoes are kind of unnatural and roofs are unnatural. There's the way that we all live these days seem to be so far from what is what it is to be a human. Yeah. What can we, like, <laughs> what, what do we need to do, do you think, to get back to being a little bit more human? Um, I don't know. I don't know if I'm the best person to ask that to. <laughs> but I, uh, I personally have tried to spend less time on social media. I think that is uh, a good thing. I, I don't think that contributes to one's humanity necessarily. Um, 
I, uh, what are the things that make you feel most human then and most connected? Um, I think spending time with my loved ones, my, my wife, my, you know, my, my, my dog, my, my, my sister, my family, my, my parents, you know, my friends going to dinner with my friends, going to their houses, hanging out with my friends. I, I, even though I don't have kids, I enjoy, I enjoy going to my friend's house and hanging out with them and their kids, you know, um, you know, writing with being creative with my friends, doing things with my friends, making things with people that I respect and the, the feeling that I'm a part of making something that I think am excited about and that I think is really good. Um, that is, I, I, again, for me, that's like, those are the moments where I feel like I am personally like living up to my potential, you know, and, and feeling like, and, and, and it is about the other people, even at times when it is work related, you know, and I, and I do think, you know, uh, the connections that you make with people, even when they are creative are, are relevant and important, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, I think those are the things that I like, I value is like personal relationships and, and creative ones, which I also view as personal. <laughs> you've done, you've done so much in the, in the space of writing and, um, and entertainment. You've then embarked in other pursuits, businesses, you know, Point Grey, mm -hmm. huge success, houseplant, massive success. That's in, a different industry that's in you know the more entrepreneurial side of your your passions what is it what is it now for you like what is the the thing what makes you having achieved all of this fired up and excited about a challenge um i get excited when i and it's it's, the, it's a simple metric i think which is anytime we're making a thing that i know i would be psyched if i saw it or got it or saw it was out in the world i get excited like and and that's kind of it. Like, if I'm making a movie and I'm like, I would love this movie. I would see this movie and be like, this is fucking great. Whoever made this movie, like, fuck, they went for it. They did it. Uh, I'd be jealous I didn't make this movie. That's when I know I'm doing something good. And it's the same thing with Housefly. If we make a thing and I'm just like, this is awesome. If I saw this, I would want this. If I saw someone else made this, I'd be like, fuck, why didn't we think of that? Why didn't we make this? What were we, why were we not thinking of this? You know, um... That to me, and and then when we do it, and we're like, we did it, and we and it works as well as you wanted to, and it feels how you wanted it to. To me, that's like, it's exciting, and because it, it is an, a creative uh, expression, and 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 I think that's what's exciting to any again, I think person with like a creative pursuit, which I view Houseplant as, and I kind of view everything as to some degree, which is like, it's all output that is meant to reflect my taste and my sensibilities and and those and that of those who are working on it with me you know um and and that could be a movie it could be a tv show it could be an ashtray it could be it could be any number of things but but to me when i'm excited about it and and when it works is when i really think it is the thing that i wanted it to be which is a thing that i'm excited about and a thing that if i saw it and someone else made it i'd be like yes that's awesome you know um and that's the same thing since we've been writing super bad like that's why we wrote super bad we were like let's write our favorite movie let's write the movie that we want to see and no one else is making and it was the same thing with pineapple express this is the end and the boys was a comic book we loved we were like let's make this no one else is gonna fucking let's make this into something you know um it's the same thing with everything that we've done for the most part which is like let's make the thing we want more than anything why not you know? make the thing that you think other people will want because who the fuck knows what other people want? <laughs> and I think luckily, that's a thing we've been lucky with is like either our taste and the public's taste has coincided or or the public has been willing to take cues from our taste and 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 bite to to what we're putting out there. You know what I mean? Um which is which is just uh, an almost intangible skill, I think, to some degree, which is just making things that connect with people in a big way. And that's not even what every creative person is trying to do. You know what I mean? I know plenty of filmmakers. I, some of my favorite movies are movies that are not trying to connect with giant audiences. You know what I mean? But those are the movies we grew up loving. And to us, that's a fun challenge is like, how do we put everything that we think is like risky and subversive and 
difficult about this idea into something and then have it connect and then have everyone go crazy for it and have everyone be like, yes, like I can't wait to see that, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And that that's just our taste, you know what I mean? Is we like to, we're thinking of like a packed theater Friday night and just wanting people to like go bonkers, you know? And like, that's not everyone's goal, you know? And so that, that, that's a big part of it too, is like, what kind of audience are you, are you hoping to have, you know? <laughs> when people, you know, study people like you, they're always looking for like the, the themes, like what's the three things he does that, you know, what, like they're trying to find the, like the secrets and whatever else they do that. They, oh, what's his morning routine, whatever else. Um, your creative process, what is from your own observation, the most unusual part of it? The uh, part that you go, no one else seems to do it this way, but fuck it. Uh, I, I tend to be able to work on, not everyone. And I work with a lot. I'm lucky also because I get to work with a lot of like, literally like the most brilliant people in the world who do what I do. So I have a very front row seat to like an incredibly high level of performance, you know, mm. um, on a writing standpoint, acting standpoint, directing standpoint, all these things I'm getting to see like truly the best versions of it, you know? Um, but I think, you know, for me, I I am I am good at switching gears and compartmentalizing. I find some writers maybe would think that is strange, and and the idea of like writing two things, two different things in one day would be strange to some writers. The idea of like, okay, I'm going to write one TV show in the morning and then a movie in the afternoon. I think that, but again, to me, it's very intuitive. Some writers find switching gears creatively, especially midday, difficult. I I can work on five different things throughout the day. And whenever I'm working on whatever thing it is, I'm pretty able to like fully engage on that thing. Um, I, I physically write more than I think most people with do. Pen. No, with, uh, on a keyboard. A but keyboard. like, I find a lot of writers want to talk about like, uh, to me, I'm like, just write it. Let's just write it. Let's just see how it looks. Let's just try it. Just write it down. Like, and I think a lot of people are precious with writing and a lot of people, you know, it's like a big, they kind of like, they, they try to like, it's very like sanctimonious or something like that, you know? But I, I try to like really just write different versions of things. Share, I share a lot of early versions of things with like a group of people that I trust. I'm sending rough versions of things to people. I'll rewrite it instantly. I'll do a hundred drafts of something, you know, um, I'm really not precious with that, you know, but, but I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if like, yeah, I don't know what other, I don't know what people expect. I, I, I'm, I'm more curious than other people's creative processes, honestly. Like it's so ingrained in who I am. Like, yeah, I've been doing it since I was so young. Like it, it's, it, it's truly like a part of like my brain chemistry is, and my development was, is built around, you know, writing and, and writing movies specifically. So like my, my personality, I think in some ways is, is, is engineered around writing and, and, and making movies in some ways. Cause I've been doing it since I was so young. So I really think it's like, it's become a very fluid part of who I am. And it doesn't feel like often I'm like sitting down to work. It's like, it's just kind of a fluid part of my day. I do also have like, I'm very, I get a schedule sent to me by my assistant at the end of every night that tells me what I'm doing the next day. I pretty much just do what's on the schedule. <laughs> she, she sends you an email, right? Yeah. And it will say 10 p.m. do this, Seth. Yeah, it'll be like 10 a.m. to 2 a.m. But And there'll be like giant bl free blocks of time in there where I will write usually, or me and my partner will organize our own. We'll, we'll organize our own writing time amidst that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty regimented from a schedule standpoint, which does surprise people because people will encounter me and be like, hey, let's get together like sometime this week. And I'm always like, like I'm like scheduled like, <laughs> like a month out pretty rigorously throughout the days. But if I asked I mean? you what your schedule was next week, would you I have no fucking clue? I don't know. Really, I don't know <laughs> my schedule was Monday. <laughs> I'm also, yeah, like I'm not, I'm good at, I, I like dealing what's right in front of me, honestly, as Same. well. Like I, I, I can't begin to process what's happening next week. Like I, I truly, that's too much for me. Like I, 
I know like the big things, like the benchmarks, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But if you're leaving the country, or yeah, if there's some big thing I have to do, but like in general, I have no idea what's happening <laughs> the week before. <laughs> have you, a bit of a left field one, but have you um, observed a, a point in your, your trajectory where you become s somewhat so successful or somewhat, you know, so famous that happiness begins to decline? No. <laughs> do, do, do they, um, it was never like being famous was never like a goal for me. You know what I mean? And so I don't have like this, this complicated thing where I was like, I was trying to become famous and then I got famous and I realized being famous sucks. I always thought being famous kind of would suck a little bit. And so the idea that it is, you know, it's great in a lot of ways and it, and it does suck in, in some ways, but that's not honestly a thing that I have a very conflicted relationship with. I've also been pretty famous since I was like 23 years old and get like, like it's been, a, you know, it's been a very long time since I got pretty famous. So I've had a lot of different relationships with it throughout that time, uh, you know, almost 20 years, I guess. And where I've been at for quite some time has been a pretty good place. And I have a lot of famous friends. I see them have much rockier roads dealing with it than I do, you know? Um, yeah. And as far as success goes, like, no, like if anything, it's like, great. Like we, I get to work with the best, you know, the filmmakers that inspired me to make movies in the first place. I get to, you know, uh, make, you know, I, they, they bring us Ninja Tr I get to make a movie out of a thing I've loved since I was a kid. We just sold a show to Apple that I'm writing and directing and starring in with, um, with my partner. So we can come up with original ideas and do whatever the fuck we want, you know? And so, uh, what's the cost? There's no cost. <laughs> I don't have kids. <laughs> if I felt guilty that I was not being a good father, that would suck. I do not have that feeling at all. <laughs> we, we, have a, we have a closing tradition on this podcast where the last guest leaves a question for the next guest. Okay, great. Not knowing who they're leaving it for. And we have a new tradition on this podcast, which I'll talk to you about. Great. The, the, the question left for you. Yeah. Okay, the handwriting is not the best. Um, <laughs> who left it? I can't tell okay, you. That's good. a secret. Looking back on your love life, okay, can you see patterns in it, good or bad? And what was the greatest love of your life? What did it feel like? And how has it affected you up until this present moment? And I guess this is a good time to slide that to you. There you go, Lauren. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I made a whole movie about how I was not well-liked in high school by women. And yeah, I was never... Uh, no, Lauren, my wife, was the first serious relationship I ever had. Um, I fell deeply in love with her very fast. We essentially moved in together after like a week and uh, almost have not spent any like significant time apart since then. You know, um, we've never broken up. We've never had any serious issue throughout the entire uh, time we've been together, which has been like 17 years or something like that. Um, and if anything, she has like really helped me do better work. She's been a real supporter. And also she herself is a brilliant writer and director and filmmaker. And she's been, you know, a very at times kind of direct voice in, in improving our work. I think the most tangible thing is the movie Neighbors, which we've talked about in the past, which is our most successful movie we've made. And and one of the things people really liked about it specifically was the relationship between me and, and Rose Byrne's character and how we are a couple, you know, traditionally in comedy for years. In my entire childhood, pretty much, it's like the comedic dynamic of a married couple was they hated each other. That was the joke. They fucking hated each other. They, they got on each other's nerves. They didn't like spending time together. The woman was usually annoying. The guy was usually cool and laid back. That was it. That was the comedic dynamic that essentially was like frozen into movie, you know, <laughs> forever. And and Lauren was the one who was like, what if it's like us and they fucking like each other and they both like to smoke weed and they both do stupid things and they both go out and party. And I'm not telling you ever to not do something fucking stupid. If anything, I'm doing stupid things too. And we put that in the movie and it, completely changed the dynamic. And I honestly think it's like one of the reasons the movie became so like liked and, and successful. And, and so that's like a specific example. And there's, there's many like, what's life like without her though? 
Um, they're, 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 thank God there's not a whole lot of life without her. We hang out a lot. Uh, and I, I don't really leave LA to make movies anymore. Honestly, part of the reason is I just like spending time with her and, and I don't like leaving Los Angeles as a result of it. I used to travel much more to make movies and shoot movies in other cities and it sucked and I would go weeks, we'd go weeks without seeing each other. And, and ultimately you're just like, this isn't worth it. Like, this is my life. Like, this is like, like, I'm not like saving up to cash in on something later. Like I'm, I'm living my life not being surrounded by the people I want to be surrounded by so I can go make a movie. And like that, that, that at times might be worth it, but I've done everything I can to not have that happen. And if you are willing to make a little less money, you can m more often than not shoot a movie in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny when I asked you what makes life great and what makes life more human, everything, every answer you gave came with the second part of the sentence, which was with friends, with the person I love, with every, yeah. every answer was with people. And so it's, it's quite, I think, inspiring and important to hear that um, you're orientating your life now that you can so that it's surrounded by people. Yeah, and it, I think it's always how I came up, thank God. And like, I, you know, my parents had a lot of friends. They always had people living with us in our house that were divorced or town that like, it was, I always was in like, I felt like I was in like a community. And then I moved to LA and I like fell in with the community. And I had my friend, Evan, and he moved in and we kind of made a little community. And like comedy, especially, Feet is like a is more of a team sport than other, I think, creative pursuits. Um, and it's it's funny. Like, I I remember years ago being at like that Vanity Fair Oscar party, and it's like, you know, big crazy party. Everyone in Hollywood's there, and there's like one corner of the party where every comedian is, <laughs> and they're like all together in one little lump, and like. And, and, and it was like, and it was so funny. And I was just like, no other genres like that. Like they're not, it's not like all the serious actors are together. They're, they're all spread out. They're all talking to people. But if you were a comedian, you were in this one little like circle where you kind of felt safe. You kind of felt insulated. You kind of felt like you were with your people. And that, that community, as far as work goes, and I'm friends with like everyone I work with, which is like great. Like the guys I do sausage party with, I grew up with them. The guy, you know, like the, 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 the it, it like goes on and on and on and on. Like I, 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 I tend to work with people that I've known a really long time. And so when I'm working, I'm getting to be with people that I, that I genuinely care about and am friends with, you know? What a privilege. Yeah. You're the first person to open this box. Great. The first person to ever open this box. This is a new tradition we're starting from right. here on out. It's exciting. All the guests that have been on this podcast all the questions they've written in this book. Oh, wow, they're, the, in, they, they're on cards now. They're on cards now. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you got swag. <laughs> <laughs> Called the, the Diary of a CEO conversation cards. You're going to be, you're going to be, I've put 20 of them. There's 60 of them in total, 60 or 100 of them in total. I've put 20 of them in here. All I'm going to ask you to do is to pick one at random. Yeah. And then answer the question. Okay. I'm going to do it. Okay. Got a QR code. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's got their handwriting. What is the greatest gift another human has given you? Love. <laughs> <laughs> also, I got paid a lot of money to make Green Hornet, so that was <laughs> <laughs> no. It's love, though. It's for sure love. <laughs> Thank you, Seth. The, the hardback version of your, the, the paperback version of your book is, is now out. It's out. And it's phenomenal. It's Thank you. It's hilarious. It's phenomenal. It's it very was fun vulnerable. to write. I'm, I'm, I mostly didn't want to humiliate myself. That was my goal. I was talking <laughs> to another friend of mine who's writing a book the other day. I, and I was just like, my whole goal was to, for the book to come out and, there, and to, the general consensus to be that I'm not a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Which I did. I feel, I feel very secure with that. Thank you, Seth. <laughs> Thank you. now been a Huel drinker for about four years roughly so much so that I ended up investing in the company um, and I play a role on the board of the company but they also very kindly sponsored this podcast and to be honest I've never said this before but Huel believed in this podcast before anybody else the CEO Julian um, 
told me before we even launched the podcast how successful it would be and that Huel would back it. And I absolutely have a huge amount of gratitude for them f- for that support, but an even greater sense of gratitude for the fact that they've helped me stay nutritionally complete throughout the chaos and hecticness of my tremendously busy business schedule. So if you haven't tried out Huel, which I hope most of you have at least given it a go by now, try it out. It's an unbelievable way to try and stay nutritionally on course if you have a hectic, busy schedule. And let me know what you think. Send me a tweet and a DM, tag me. Let me know what you think. Quick word from one of our sponsors. I have to say, I've been on a bit of a journey with this brand because when I started my business in new territories, when we first moved Social Chain to the to New York City, the first place we went to was WeWork. We moved four of our team members out to New York City and we built the business from there. Um, I have to say there's something magical about WeWorks. I've spent the last two or three weeks in LA in a WeWork and as you walk in the front door every day, it's almost like that sense of community, that sense of magic, excitement, camaraderie is tangible. And you don't get that when you're working at home. You don't get that often when you're sat in your bed on your laptop. There's something about getting out and getting into a WeWork that makes me feel a sense of entrepreneurship and and creativity and building. And the way that WeWorks are designed, both both in the way that they offer subscriptions so that you can work you know, on demand, but also the, the flexibility of the contracts means that it's just the perfect place for businesses to scale their companies. And if you haven't checked out WeWork and you want to, you can go to we.co slash CEO and there you can get 50% off a trial day at WeWork close to you. Uh-huh.